Good evening. My name is Margaret Ann Bollmeyer. I'm the president of MCB Foundation, and we are so happy to have you here tonight. Welcome. I hope you enjoyed this video about the Prestamons. I was standing here watching, realizing that maybe some of you in the back couldn't read, um, but Ed's surgery lasted 13 hours, and his recovery was uh, in rehabilitation was 43 days in the Sheltering Arms Rehabilitation Hospital, which is a partner with VCU. Um, it's a wonderful story. The Prestamons live in Asheville, North Carolina. They just happened to be in Richmond visiting their daughter when this incident occurred. And I think, so he referred to the being fortunate that he was in Richmond at the time. Um, and they were very generous to allow us to make this video to tell their story. It really, this video really highlights some of the amazing work that's happening at VCU. And we're so happy you're here tonight to hear about more of it. So tonight is our 11th Discovery Series event here in Williamsburg, and we're starting our sixth year of the Discovery Series here. I want to make, give a special welcome to those of you who are members of our Discovery Society because we really appreciate your support. It helps so many things happen um, at VCU. I also want to say tonight we're very pleased to be joined by our Access Support and Assistance Program, known often by the acronym ASAP. And we have all three of our nurses here tonight, Denise Lynch, Cheryl LaCroix, and Sarah Saud are all here tonight. Thank you. And a special thanks to Denise, who some of you may not have realized, you've probably heard the beautiful piano music coming in, but Denise was playing the piano for us tonight, so thank you. So our goal with the Discovery Series was really to showcase, um, highlight some of the really cutting edge medical care and research that's happening at VCU. And tonight we're gonna hear more about another area of excellence. So we have our largest group of participants tonight. We're over 200 people here tonight from Williamsburg. We're so happy to have you here. And for those of you who've been here before and maybe remember it being a little bit maybe a little bit tight and crowded toward the uh, strolling supper part of the evening. We've opened, uh, uh, the Country Club has opened up a whole nother room for us in the back, so we have a lot more space to move around. And if the weather holds out for us, we have the patio open as well. So we, um, we're not gonna be rushing to the strolling supper. We have a wonderful program, but when we get to that part, that should be very nice as well. Um, in addition to our ASAP team, we also have a number of trustees from the MCV Foundation who are here tonight, um, some from Williamsburg and some from Richmond. If you all would each just stand and just be recognized. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight. Becky in the back. We're also joined by a, our Williamsburg Discovery Series host committee who really are the brains behind this program and um, all of the success that we've had here, and we, we just can't thank them enough for their guidance and their support and leadership. So I'm gonna introduce those people, and if you'll just wave when I um, say your name or stand if, if, um, to be recognized. Julie Baxter and Paul Dresser. Over here, Louise and Bob Canfield. Back that way. Jenny and Charles Crone, here in the middle. Uh, Jane and Jim Kaplan. Here on the second row, thank you, Jim. And Judy Starkey, and I know, there you are, Judy, back there. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Our moderator tonight is Dean Peter Buckley. He's Dean of the School of Medicine at VCU. He is a former Dean of the Medical College of Georgia, and he is a psychiatrist with a special, special expertise in schizophrenia and he'll be introducing our panel tonight. Peter. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. It's a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you all. I've had the opportunity to be here before, and so uh, we've a larger, and I suspect a rowdier cloud, crowd this <laughs> evening. So. We should, have a, we should have a lot of fun. Uh, my wife, Leone, sends her regards. Uh, she's enjoyed being here before, couldn't be here this evening. But I was telling her as we were coming here, I was saying just what a privilege. And I said to her, you know, did you ever think in your wildest dreams 
that here I am from Dublin, Ireland, and now I'm in Williamsburg uh, with this event. And Leone said, and you, some of you know Leone, Leone said to me, you're not in my wildest dreams. So <laughs> that's, that's my wife, Leone. So <clears throat> you, you enjoyed the video, which was really about um, heart replacement, and that's nothing about this evening. So this evening is about mental health addictions, and it is about uh, Alzheimer's disease and neurological conditions. And the reason that the host group chose that is because these conditions are ubiquitous, and they are very often poorly understood. And so we have put together an array of experts for you uh, this evening, and we're also leaving plenty of time so that if you have questions from the floor, we can take that a little bit uh, after we're finished the formal uh, panel. And so I'm going to call up each person now. And the first is Dr. Al, 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 Al Albert. And I'll tell you a little bit about each person uh, as they come up. So Al Arias, come on up, Al. Al uh, came to us about a year and a half ago from a little known place called Yale University. <laughs> and <coughs> Al completed his training and a fellowship there. He's a specialist in addictions disorders. And he's also not just a specialist, but he also does research on treatments, specifically medication treatments for addiction disorders. He's a remarkable expert, as you'll hear shortly. Please take a seat, Al. The next up is Dr. Bob Findling. And Bob came to us from another little known place called Johns Hopkins <laughs> University in Baltimore. Uh, but Bob, I've had the privilege of counting as a friend for almost 25 years. We were together at Case Western Reserve University. And Bob joins as the incoming chair of the Department of Psychiatry. Bob himself thinks he's a new, unique breed. But I'll tell you another reason why he's a unu unique breed. Because he's trained as a pediatrician, he's trained as an adult psychiatrist, and he's also trained as a child psychiatrist. And he also went to London to get an MBA degree. So that is, that is Bob. Next up is Dr. Rochelle Hayes. Rochelle, please join us. Rochelle did her training, unlike at the other two places, which are questionable institutions. Rochelle did her training at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, <clears throat> and Although you jumped the gun and, and congratulated and thanked Michelle for being here, I'm telling you, you're going to thank her again because this very evening, she's here with you when she should be home with her eight-year-old son whose birthday it is this evening. So thank you so much, Michelle, for being here. And the final individual is Another colleague had come home to uh, Richmond and to Virginia, and that is uh, Dr. Uh, Smith, Dr. Gordon Smith. Come on up, Gordon. Gordon is chair of the Department of Neurology, and as I said, he began his training at uh, UVA. He's a native of Richmond, and he went off and did further, uh, further training in uh, Michigan, and then was for a large part of his career on faculty at uh, University of Utah, where immediately before coming here, he was the uh, vice chair for research in their department of neurology. And he's a uh, neurologist, but with a, a particular research focus on both clinical trials and peripheral nervous conditions. So that is the panel that is with us, and I've got some really wacky, qu no, I've got some great <laughs> questions to ask them, if you'll bear with me as I sit down for a second. <clears throat> so let's begin with, uh, with Bob, and uh, a kind of two-part question for you. And so you're, you're an expert in child, and you're an expert in adult, we know that there's a lot of attention deficit disorder in children. 
So I want you to tell us a little bit about kind of is that increasing in children? And then also you hear people talk about adults with attention deficit disorder. What's the state of that in adults? So I'm going to be able to help answer that question. And uh, the first real piece is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Sometimes people hear it as ADHD. Sometimes people call it ADD. It's very simple. It's a condition when young people, and it begins in childhood, have a hard time sitting still, focusing, and concentrating. Now, if I continue to talk in a monotone for five minutes, we're all going to have a hard time paying attention. <laughs> so it's, again, many of the conditions are part of normal life. But it's when it's a problem. If a youngster can't sit for school, or if the child is not able to focus on their schoolwork at enough so that they're now spending hours doing a homework assignment that shouldn't take hours. So it's not a problem unless it's a problem. And that's the important part. About 5% of kids have this, which is common enough, but not extraordinarily common. And what was interesting about it, when it was first described, it was described in children and then ultimately teenagers. And the notion was that you grew out of it as you got older. Well, to make a long story short, everybody, everybody, everybody. Don't go with that. Don't say it. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody. I know who my friends are. Um, becomes less active and less restless and more serene as they get older. So what was initially believed is people grew out of it. But in fact, what has become clear is that people grow into it. And because these are oftentimes fidgety kids, they're just not as fidgety as adults. But they still have difficulties with restlessness, concentration, and distractibility. And, and that accounts for about two out of three youngsters with ADHD. So although some people grow out of it, most people grow into it. And it's important because this can cause all kinds of difficulties in someone's life, from how they well do at work, or how they get along with loved ones. And in fact, people with ADHD as adults have higher rates of divorce, unemployment, substance abuse. And because they're distractible, they get into automobile accidents as well. So in many ways, it is oftentimes trivialized. But the impact that it can have on a life, whether you're a child, a teenager, or adult, can be quite profound beyond just the fidgetiness of this distraction. <coughs> Thank you, for, uh, <coughs> thank you for clarifying that. Let me talk, turn to uh, Gordon. Another area that's often highlighted in the media is dementias and Alzheimer's, and then you hear other forms of dementias. Can you tell us a little bit about how common these are, and are they all one condition or several conditions? Yeah, so it's a great question, Peter. I think the first thing is to really define what dementia is. It's a term that's often misused in the media or public persons, and this can cause some degree of confusion and, frankly, consternation on the part of patients. So <clears throat> dementia is simply a progressive decline in cognitive function relative to a previous baseline. Uh, and this is uh, similar to something Bob said that impacts function. So memory loss in and of itself doesn't imply a dementia, but someone who has memory loss, other cognitive problems that impact with function, that, that's the definition of a dementia. And of course, the most common dementia is sort of the scourge of our time, which is Alzheimer's disease. It's interesting, you know, in the, up until maybe the 1980s, uh, Alzheimer's disease was considered as being quite rare uh, because it was thought of as a disease of uh, middle age and maybe early late life, 50s and 60s. And in fact, Alzheimer's first patient was a young woman. And it was only at that time that we recognized that the pathology was actually very common and what at the time was referred to as senile dementia. Of course, Alzheimer's is very common. It impacts about 6% of us, uh, which sounds like it's not that many. It's similar to the number of kids with ADHD. But put differently, uh, women have about a 20% um, lifetime risk of Alzheimer's and men about a 12% risk. So it's very common. But Alzheimer's only accounts for about 60 or 65% of dementias. Uh, there are many other causes. The second most common cause is a disorder that's familiar to all of us, and that's uh, stroke or vascular dementia. And there are a number of other 
uh, neurodegenerative causes of dementia. Uh, the second most common cause after Alzheimer's disease is a dementia called Lewy body dementia, which is perhaps a less familiar term, but it's closely related to a term that I think we all know, which is Parkinson's disease, which can also cause dementia. And I, I think one of the things we've learned over the last uh, you know, 10 years or so is that these diseases are closely related. Uh, frontotemporal dementia, for instance, is a, another uh, perhaps uncommon but not rare cause of dementia that actually is closely related to Lou Gehrig's disease or Alzheimer's disease. And so these are all related. And one of the things that's particularly interesting is the extent to which people who have dementia have multiple different pathologies. And by that I mean if we look at their brains after they pass, we'll see that the large majority, if not the vast majority, of people have Alzheimer's disease. Not only have the Alzheimer's pathologies of plaques and tangles, but they'll have Lewy bodies, and they'll have uh, vascular changes, and other underlying kind of pathology or causes for their dementia, which actually is an important discovery because it informs how we think about how we might prevent dementia, how we might treat dementia. Great, okay. Now, uh, Rochelle, <coughs> We've heard a little bit about attention deficit disorders. We've heard about uh, dementias. These sound like things that just kind of happen to you, but tell us about what you can do in your own life by healthy living and by positive psychology to either combat these conditions, ward them off, or reduce the morbidity or mortality from them. Thank you so much for asking that question. So I'm a clinical health psychologist, and what I do daily love is helping um, my patients and the public change their behavior to reduce mortality and morbidity. There's clear evidence to show that the top 12 leading disorders or reasons for death, think about it, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, um, uh, 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 COPD, all are worsened by just the behaviors that we do. Um, think about it, um, tobacco use, obesity, not taking your medications, overuse of drugs, it's all related to health behavior. So I study um, how our behaviors all impact disease, progression, and mortality. And because we see that relationship, there's a lot of research that shows that when we help patients who are and change their behavior, that we can reduce some of the severity of some of the symptoms and reduce mortality rates as well. Um, for example, in for smoking, if smoke, quitting smoking is one of the best things you can do to increase your mortality if you've been smoking a lot as well. As well. Um, so there's a lot of things that, you know, it's just easy to just say stop and stop just doing this behavior, but sometimes we do need some, some help. That's where treatment and working with a therapist can come in handy. Great. Now, <clears throat> Rochelle mentioned cigarette smoking, but you will be well aware that there is a um, new fad of uh, e-cigarettes, and you'll well aware that vaping has now kind of been uh, in the public eye, including a number of recent deaths. So we thought it would be useful, even though we, as I look out, I don't see people vaping in the audience. <laughs> Appreciate that. But we thought it would be good to have Al give us kind of what's the state of the art in terms of the, the frequency of use of e-cigarettes, because some of our uh, uh, audience may have uh, children or grandchildren uh, that may be considering that. And then also, what's the risks associated with this, and how does that fit from a kind of media What's the hype and what's the evidence? Sure, and uh, that's, that's an important and timely uh, question here. And um, uh, I think some of the most important things to stress are that, that um, uh, there are some real dangers, it looks like. And its use is very widespread and perhaps increasing, especially in adolescence. So a, a recent um, poll suggests that over a third of high school seniors have vaped in the last year. So think about that. That's, that's a lot of kids in this country that are, that are vaping. Um, now, um, you probably also have heard, been watching any TV or anything recently. So the CDC and other public health authorities 
around the country uh, have been collecting cases of severe lung injury and death. Uh, and you know, this has really been publicized only recently. If we were talking about this six months ago, the story might be different. But um, at most recent count, they think that there's been at least a thousand cases of severe lung injury and hospitalization and, and at least 18 deaths. So that's probably an underestimate. Uh, and so that's, that's pretty alarming. And when you think about the number of kids using it, it's, it's even more alarming. And um, what's, what's scary and remarkable about, um, about these recent findings is that a lot of the people suffering from this are young kids. Uh, now the deaths have been kind of spread out across the age groups and perhaps more favoring older people um, who perhaps were, had more problems and were weaker when they um, suffered this acute lung injury. But, um, uh, but the majority of people that are having the injury and the hospitalizations are actually younger, uh, and some people in their, in their teens even. And um, I think that's very poignant because um, when you think about tobacco use, and we all know that tobacco use is bad, but I think that the majority of the problems come after a while of smoking. Uh, but it looks like e-cigarettes and, and vaping, uh, there may be problems early on. So you don't have this kind of safety period where you can change your mind and quit and perhaps go back to normal. We did, as far as we know, that may not exist. So that's pretty, pretty alarming. Um, in terms of what, what is really causing causing a problem, you know, is it the nicotine? Is it, what is it in the mixtures that's doing it? Nobody knows, uh, which is also kind of alarming. So um, some scientists have pointed to uh, vitamin E and vitamin E oils uh, that are sometimes put in uh, the mixtures. Um, another thing that's been noted is a lot of the people that have gotten really sick with this have been vaping THC in forms of uh, cannabis. Um, and not just nicotine uh, recently. But um, right now the CDC is recommending that you not vape. Uh, and you know, where do you draw the line with e-cigarettes and vaping and vaping cannabis? And, you know, right now we don't really know that any of it is safe. And um, uh, I think so those, those are the big messages. There also may be uh, something to, to uh, the nicotine that's vaporized this way causing liver damage. But that's the story that's kind of unfolding. In a Laval, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> just for the audience, so that you know, not, not, not ju just as Al an expert, but we have another colleague at VCU that has a $20 million federal grant studying these cigarettes and the long-term effects. So we really don't know what those are yet, and that's going to be an important part to keep an eye on as this story unfolds. Now, let me go back to uh, Bob. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the areas that causes lay people a lot of consternation is, is what, what do you do when somebody is expressing to harm themselves? And that, that's obviously very distressing for the person that, that feels wanting to harm themselves. But it's also distressing for the lay person. And so it, it is, how serious is that, first of all? when someone expresses that? And then how should a lay person manage that? Well, you know, this comes up so often. I was having breakfast with my wife back home in Baltimore this morning, and I asked her. Now, my wife is in the field as well, uh, as Peter knows, and uh, I generally refer to her as the brains in the operation. So she, I, I figured, OK, I'm going to probably get a question. Funny, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I said, OK, what do I do? And she's in the field. She goes, take it really seriously. Don't joke around. So of course, I didn't listen to her, because I'm trying to take a serious co to topic and just, again, make sure that people listen. Because the important message is, take it seriously. Oftentimes, people don't take it seriously. Now, thinking about thoughts about death are common. They occur in any given year up to 20% of people, which is really important to know. But the wish, the true wish to be dead, is less common, but very serious. It spans throughout the life cycle. Suicide is a leading cause of death. 
in people over the age of 65. It is the third leading cause of death in teenagers. So this is a very big deal. Uh, and so when people hear about this, take it seriously, for any, and the most important message that I would provide to you is it's not a family's mem member's job or a loved one's member's job to manage it. The idea is this is this, there's a time to love your family and a, and, and a time to make sure your family gets the care that they need. And so the first place to begin is take it seriously. Go to your primary care doctor, go uh, to a counselor if one's involved, but take it seriously and don't own it yourself. Uh, and, and, uh, and you know, in, of all the things that we talk about, suicide is highly preventable. But because of the stigma associated with uh, behavioral health, or the concerns that people have maybe never felt the depths of despair that they would even think this would be a rational thing to think about, that it's not given the uh, attention it, it really does deserve. So simply put, uh, take it seriously. It's a preventable cause of death. And the good news is treatments that, call, that can address the underlying cause of this are readily, readily available. And that's what makes it more tragic than anything these are preventable conditions. Can we predict suicide in any way? And that's, a, that's probably the hardest question of all. It's for the lay person, you really can't. Yeah. Certainly, I think for physicians, there's lots of things we do when faced with someone with these concerns that we take our time uh, to really ask about and consider and, and to determine the degree of risk. But of course, none of us have a crystal ball. But what we can do is measure the odds and then make decisions collaboratively with folks. But the important part is to realize that it takes time and skill and practice to do these assessments thoughtfully with, in order to get to a really good sense of safety. And so ultimately, this is not a job for a family member. It's not a job for a loved one. But more importantly, uh, assessment matters. It's perfect, but it matters. So I want to ask you a related question to that. If, if you have somebody and you're worried about them being depressed, if you ask them are you suicidal, are you going to make them suicidal, are you going to kind of cause that? And funny enough, people used to wonder that, yeah. which of course is intuitive. And uh, a study was done about 10 years ago that specifically asked just that question. And it was, the answer is a resounding no cannot cause you to become suicidal, it cannot harm you. And in fact, what one of the reasons that prompted that is not just for concerned family members, we in the medical professions oftentimes avoided asking people yeah. who looked depressed these questions in, whole, in fear that we would somehow do something to harm them. Oh, yeah. And we learned it doesn't. And so for many of us, when you go see your doctor, do they ask you questions about depression now that they never used to? That's why because we learned that asking about it is the only way to really talk about it. And it's not something that is oftentimes done in polite conversation. So that's why you are asked these questions now that you might not have ever been asked previously, because we've learned it's actually helpful to ask, not wrong. Great question. So I also want to uh, let you know that Bob has conducted uh, studies in children of mood stabilizing drugs that have been effective for mood problems and suicidality, and has even uh, done work that has led the FDA to approve drugs. So I'm very proud of your work in that area, Bob. And uh, let me go back to Gordon. And, uh, and Gordon told us a little bit about what the brains look like in terms of Alzheimer's and frontal lobe and uh, vascular dementia. Uh, and, and I think you said if someone has, uh, if, if there's a post-mortem examination and even someone has Alzheimer's, that they might also have some post-mortem evidence of vascular uh, effects. So how do you figure that out from a clinical perspective as opposed to after someone has passed away and you examine the brain? Are there tricks of the trade that can distinguish between one type of dementia, say vascular dementia, and, and Alzheimer's? To some extent, there are. So <clears throat> there's certainly a 
classic presentation of Alzheimer's disease versus frontotemporal dementia versus Lewy body dementia versus vascular dementia, their criteria one can follow. I think the, the interesting question embedded in there, of course, is what do we do about it? And I think the, uh, you know, the intersection and interplay between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's is powerful right now. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk later, and if not, in the back room about exciting therapeutics for neurodegenerative disease. But we've got extremely effective therapeutics for vascular disease. And people are probably expecting it's going to be clot-busting drugs or neurosurgeons riding into the rescue. But Rochelle is the answer to stroke, 80% of stroke, 80% of stroke. And to quote Bob Findling, 80% of stroke is preventable. It's remarkable. If I could patent a pill that would prevent 80% of stroke, I, I, you know, I could work for free. And the dean would be very happy with that. Um, and uh, so that's quite remarkable. But what we know now over the last several years and, and longer is that these same risk factors that lead to stroke lead to dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. So if you have diabetes, hypertension, if you smoke cigarettes, if you have sleep apnea or uh, you, you sleep deprive yourself, your risk of Alzheimer's goes up. And in fact, by 2050, we're going to see a threefold increase in the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, primarily in people over 85, where we know these shared risk factors are common. And what's particularly powerful is while one can't pre uh, prevent 80% of uh, Alzheimer's disease by controlling risk factors, the estimate is that we can probably prevent 30 or 35% of Alzheimer's disease. And to have a drug that did that would be transformational in society. And we have the tools at hand right now to prevent almost a third of Alzheimer's disease by paying attention to vascular risk factors. And I bet all of us, myself included, have these risk factors and have to be mindful about blood pressure and, uh, and diabetes and so forth. Uh, but for dementia, there are specific ones that we need to be attentive to beyond those, which include cognitive engagement and challenging oneself intellectually or remaining engaged, I think in particular sleep, which I think is an empowering message. We don't need to wait for exciting molecular therapeutics to treat Alzheimer's disease. There is a lot all of us in this room can do right now, taking uh, Rochelle's work. And you know, my own research is largely focused on using diet and exercise and lifestyle modification and peripheral nerve disease. There are people doing the same work in Alzheimer's disease, and I think it can be really powerful. It's very interesting. Can I take it back at the beginning? You mentioned, and I may be wrong, but I think you mentioned that Alzheimer's is more common in females than in males. Is that an effect of females living longer, or is it an effect of more risk factors or something else, or, or do you know? Uh, I don't think we know fully. Part of it probably is longevity, yeah. uh, and part of it may is, is other than that, and we don't fully understand that. It's clearly an important uh, issue to know, and what I didn't say is that there are also uh, racial disparities in Alzheimer's risk, yeah. and, and this may in part tie into vascular risk factors. So African Americans and Hispanic and Latinos are more likely to have Alzheimer's disease, and these are very important not only in understanding the biology of the disease, and in fact, you know, we've been talking with Ken Kendler about you know trying to develop a program as a you know very very well published uh, expert in population genetics and psychiatry about how we can use our current team at, at VCU to understand the population genetics to answer these questions. But I think there's a more fundamental issue of how we go about screening and supporting these at-risk populations from a prevention perspective. Right, okay. Um, Gordon mentioned uh, preventative management for dementia. Uh, <clears throat> let me switch gears. There's a phrase, you are what you eat. And so, in terms of obesity management, tell us about health psychology and uh, personal behaviors that you work on that can improve uh, obesity management. Yeah, so how many people have been trying to lose weight? <laughs> many people? Okay. So, um, there's a lot to say. Um, you can teach a whole course on this. Um, obesity is um, one of these diseases that um, it can be treated primarily the first line of treatment is lifestyle intervention. And essentially what we mean by that is controlling what you eat and how you eat, but also physical activity. Um, and in obesity,
obesity, um, you know, in the world, we keep hearing about, should I go on this diet or that diet? I'm sure you've all heard about that. But the truth is, there is no best diet. They all work the same. When we do head-to-head -head trials in terms of weight loss, um, each diet does the same. And so I tell pigs, folks, you know, who want to follow any particular diet that, you know, the best diet is the one that you can keep. And so if you are able to restrict yourself or do whatever you want to do, eat whatever, and follow that long term, then that's great. However, we know that there are usually two stages in weight loss, and that's the weight loss stage and then there's weight maintenance stage. We know what to do to help people lose weight essentially, you know, um, portion size and control how much you eat. But the weight maintenance stage, a lot of people don't know what to do. And a lot of times, the best thing to do in the weight maintenance stage is physical activity. But regardless of all of this, there's this other component, the psychology piece, the lifestyle behavioral piece that I want to chat with you and talk more about. And that is, you know, sometimes you might be stressed and you might find that you're eating a little bit more or eating quickly. Um, sometimes we call that binge eating. And a lot of that behavior, this particular behavior, is brought on by our thoughts, our feelings, our thoughts and our feelings. And if you've ever have, um, thought, oh man, I just didn't do very well, I had a very stressful day. You're having a lot of negative thoughts. And those thoughts tend to lead to negative feelings, which then push us to do a, a negative behavior. In this case, overeating, binge eating. And so as a psychologist, one of the things that we help patients to do is look and see what is the relationship between their thoughts and their feelings. Understand, have people understand what are their feelings that they have and what are the reciprocal types of thoughts and have, be able to change that. That's one way we do it. Behaviorally, which is probably the first thing we do is, you know, there are a lot of things we could do. Like if there are chocolate chip cookies at home, let's say Halloween, you know, um, you're going to get candy or whatever for the, the neighborhood kids. I tell my patients, don't get the food or the candies that you like. Okay, get the worst candy, <laughs> the thing that you hate, because you know you won't, hopefully you won't eat those. And No so, one's going to listen. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot of different things that we can do to change your environment, change your workplace, change your home environment. That's what we call stimulus control. And we do this a lot in the addictions world as well to help the patient or help yourself change your behavior. So I'm simplifying it a lot, but in the gist, we want to help people to change their thoughts as well as change their environment. And by changing your thoughts and your environment, you're changing your behavior. Um, and so that is essentially what I do. I'm sure I'm going to get more questions, but it's essentially what we do for treating obesity. Okay, terrific. Now, uh, in addition to kind of positive behaviors and managing your lifestyle, a lot of uh, people end up on um, mood supporting drugs like Prozac. And those drugs have been out for a good long time, and so many people have been a while on these drugs. Do they? Do they affect the, the brain in any way, Bob, over the long haul? So the good news is a lot of people get these medicines, a whole lot, a whole lot, to quote, quote. A whole lot. Thank you. I, I need all the help I can get. Um, to make a long story short, there's no evidence that these cause any detrimental effect long term in the brain. And that's important. But we do know that untreated mood disorders, like depression, uh, can cause serious difficulties. Not forgetting simply about the human suffering that accompanies this. It can impact relationships, it can impact uh, how one does at work. And again, we've talked a little bit about suicide. So there always is a theoretical risk of anything, but after Prozac came out on the market in 1987, and it's, um, I can do the math, it's 32 years since that has happened. Um, you know, there's an old saying, if you gotta look that hard to find a signal, it probably ain't worth finding. Um, 32 years into it, we haven't found anything. So at the end of all of this, 
We know what depression causes. We know what depression does. We know how it causes people to suffer. And so in many ways, if, it, if these medicines are right, you can feel reassured that we know a lot more now than we did 32 years ago. Uh, and, and of course, that's a discussion to always have, obviously, with the people providing you this care. Because the most important part about, at least when I'm treating people, is not about the act of treating people, but developing relationships that are collaborative. Because oftentimes these, uh, uh, these relationships last for months and years. And ultimately, you have to work together. And so really, it's developing a partnership between the care provider, whether it be a psychologist, or a nurse practitioner, or a physician, and, and the patient, and oftentimes their family. Um, so the insight from the psychiatrist today will be this, uh, uh, the following. Relationships matter. And so in your healthcare, uh, relationships matter. Having somebody you trust is invaluable, and who can share with you this information. It's not just about the knowledge. It's about the sharing of knowledge. Okay, so that, does that then mean if Prozac doesn't affect the brain that someone could kind of stop it, come off it quickly, or what, what, what's the implications of that though? So the, the good news about this is also we know that oftentimes if people have started this treatment, you can kind of know what the history is before treatment. For some people, They've done well their whole lives, have had a problem, started treatment, oftentimes in combination with talk therapy, and they do better. And that's great. And then in about 50% of those instances, they can actually eventually, in collaboration with their caregivers, end up stopping things. However, if this has happened multiple times in someone's past, best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So if you, this has happened to you multiple times before, and for many people that's exactly how this happens, it may be more difficult. But again, at the, as all, uh, what I would tell folks is the risks of the medicine right now over the long term are mostly theoretical. The risks of the condition are real and pronounced and profound and pernicious. And so ultimately, having someone who can work with you about this is really vital. And of course, if you really want to give it a go with your, uh, collaboratively with your care provider, you don't pick the week before your child's wedding to give this a whirl. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a child or a teenager, you don't declare that you want to get off of this before your SATs, right? You pick times, you pick the right time because ultimately, not only do you want to make sure that if their difficulties reoccur, you get the treatment you need quickly, but everybody needs somebody. And so you may not see it yourself, but if your loved one does or your parent does, that's where you look for help. So pick the time wisely, know how you got here, and absolutely, uh, the more people who love you to help you, the better. Okay, so Bob's told us about <coughs> Prozac and antidepressant <coughs> medicines, and I think you said Prozac's been a, a, on the market since 87. But you'll also be aware that we've had uh, very new drugs that are uh, curious in the sense that we now have cannabis, which is a uh, addictive agent. We now have cannabis uh, licensed and available as medical marijuana. And then we have oils that aren't cannabis, but they sound like cannabis. They're like kind of first cousins. So, so tell us about that whole area, which is like at warp speed at the moment. Right, right, yeah, another hot topic for sure, and I'm sure there's a lot of people wondering about this. Um, uh, we see new products all the time that are advertised to us for CBD and, and other extracts of cannabis, and et cetera, but um, I, I think um, we know a little bit about the potential benefits uh, and, um, and a fair amount about the risks. And, um, so let me first, uh, unpack this and talk about CBD, cannabidiol, um, which you probably have heard a lot about. So that's one of the chemical constituents of the cannabis 
plant and, and uh, marijuana. Um, so there's now some, some good evidence that this is helpful for seizures, in particular a couple of uh, forms of seizures that happen in kids. Uh, and there's now an FDA-approved medication, which is basically isolated CBD, cannabidiol, um, that is, uh, is used and is FDA-approved. It's, it's uh, effective for helping kids with this condition. And, and it may be helpful in other cases of seizures also. But, um, so that, that we know, there, there's some evidence to suggest that CBD by itself or in combination with other cannabis compounds is maybe helpful for pain and inflammation. Um, and that's you know, not really strong evidence, but there's some evidence. And um, uh, now beyond that, there's interest in, in it being a potential treatment for a lot of different things. And I think some of the most interesting things are that you know, perhaps it may end up being a treatment for mood or anxiety disorders uh, or addictive disorders or uh, even uh, things like, like schizophrenia. Uh, and, but we don't know yet. And I think if I was to emphasize one thing about CBD, it's that there's really a lot of unknowns. There's a lot that we don't know. And in terms of the risks for CBD itself, isolated, it doesn't appear uh, that, it's, that it is addictive by itself, um, although perhaps needs to still be researched more. And, um, but uh, I guess, um, if I were to emphasize some of the some of the uh, the bad things about it that we suspect. So one thing uh, you've been told to to look out for great uh, grapefruit juice, right? If you take uh, any number of medications, because it can inhibit certain enzymes that break down medicines in your body. So it looks like maybe CBD also uh, is active uh, at at doing the same thing. So it's an inhibitor of one of these enzymes. It could have some drug drug interactions, which you know, might be relevant, especially if you're on a number of medications. Um, beyond that, there could be some risk of liver damage, although it's a little unclear what's going on. It seems like maybe there's some risk, at least at really high doses. Uh, and uh, it maybe it's only when you're taking other things that are potentially uh, could cause damage to your liver. So, so there's a lot of unknowns. Um, but I think it, it's potentially promising, but, but I would just stress that there's so much that's not known about it, I would say, you know, be cautious in, in taking it, and certainly don't take high doses uh, of it. Um, and so let me get back around to, to medical uh, cannabis or medical marijuana, and, and different, there's many different forms. Uh, you know, I can't really cover it all, but, but let me just sort of boil down some right. general things here. And that's that you know, there, there is some evidence that it can be helpful for some things, and, and seizures is one thing, uh, and um, but there's also some evidence uh, so it's FDA approved for a couple of things, and that's, that's it's, it's a, um, a, a produced form of THC, and then another molecule that's like it, uh, which is one of the main psychoactive components of the cannabis plant. But so that's actually been around for a while, uh, Marinol, and, and so that's used for people that have problems with nausea and eating, that have uh, cancer and are on chemotherapy, or if they have, uh, you know, kind of a wasting syndrome because they can't eat because maybe they have HIV or another kind of chronic disease. So, so there's some evidence that it can be really helpful for that. Uh, and it can help people eat and, and try to maintain their health when they have these other things going on, like, like cancer and, and are on a lot of uh, strong chemotherapies. Uh, and then additionally, so, so for, the, for medical marijuana or for cannabis, there, there is some evidence to suggest that it's helpful for chronic pain and neuropathic pain. Um, it's, it's maybe a little debatable how strong the evidence is or whatever, but there's some. Uh, and um, so, so I, I think those are the kind of the main things. I, I think there are maybe some more risks that are worth paying attention to with, with medical marijuana. So, and these we know pretty well at this point. And I think one of the big <laughs> things is that it can cause depression and worsen anxiety in a lot of people. Uh, and it's a, it's a big thing for, for adolescents and for kids that are out there smoking weed and, and, uh, and becoming depressed, you know, and even suicidal and things like that. And, um, but but it's, it's relevant to everybody. Uh, and also, it, we think it probably uh, has some association to causing psychotic disorders in people.
people. Uh, and um, so there are some real serious risks. Beyond that, it perhaps, uh, it perhaps plays a role in, in driving accidents. Um, so, you know, it can impair you like alcohol can impair you if you're driving. So there are a number of risks, and, but there, there may be some, some benefits. And I think over time uh, with science and medicine, we can maybe boil down what are some of the good parts of cannabis and use just the good parts without putting ourselves at risk. But again, I'll just be cautious um, in your approach to it. And, and um, what, one thing that's maybe promising about CBD versus just medical marijuana in general is that we don't think it's that psychoactive in that it doesn't make you high or euphoric or hallucinate like THC and other cannabis compounds uh, can. So, so if CBD you know, is safe, if it turns out to be reasonably safe, it may be uh, a better alternative. Great. Uh, you did an amazing job. This is a very complicated, fast-moving area, and, and you just covered it beautifully. Thank you. Uh, Rochelle, tell us about, you mentioned in general terms, you talked about weight gain management, but tell us about new therapies, just like Al talk, talked about new drug therapies. Tell us what's new in the psychological therapy area. So in um, psychotherapy, psychotherapy is, has been around for, from, for years, hundreds, decades. Um, you know, we have now come to having what we call a third wave of psychotherapy. So the first wave was Freud, psychodynamic, second wave being more Carl Rogers um, and um, Albert Maslow who focused on um, self-actualization, we call that the humanistic wave. The third wave being cognitive behavioral therapy, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, that really focuses on the relationships between your thoughts and feelings and behaviors, which I alluded to before. And then within CBT, within probably the last 20 years, we have a newer wave of CBT, and that incorporates um, therapies like acceptance commitment therapy, ACT, dialectical behavioral therapy, um, schema therapy, and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So the good news is that for most of, for all of our psychological behaviors, behavioral health, whether it be depression, um, anxiety, that all of these treatments, even with the humanistic and psychodynamic, can be effective. In fact, when we look at meta-analyses, we do see that the effect size of talk therapy, psychotherapy, is going to be effective on most all psychological outcomes. And the differences between therapies is not that great, actually, not that big of a difference. So we know that that, compared to not having any therapy, we're gonna see strong effect size. So if you're thinking about, I wanna see a therapist, but what kind of therapy and what does this therapist do? I think that it's still a very good, important question to ask the person that you wanna work with, but know that, as Dr. Finling said, that it is actually the therapeutic alliance that gives us effect sizes of like 0.5 to 0.8. And in the research world, that's pretty strong. It's pretty much saying that it's really about that relationship. And I don't know, you all can tell me, but I know we care about how much our doctors know, but I think sometimes we care more about how much that doctor knows about you. And so it's really a testament to say that yes, you want to be paired with a therapist who knows and can talk about different types of therapies, but also you have a good relationship with them. Now, that being said, there are some um, therapies that we are more likely to want to use than others. So for example, for panic disorder, specific phobias, behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy has been kind of the mainstream by David Barlow in Boston. However, recent research has shown that when we do ACT, acceptance commitment therapy, DBT, these new wave therapies, that they have also been successful. And if we look at set aside depression and anxiety, but when we talk about how do these new therapies help with weight loss or smoking cessation, those are the things that I do as a health psychologist, they equally have been as effective to using ACT and DBT and CBT. In fact, in my own practice, I don't, and most therapists don't practice just CBT or psychodynamic. It's probably in your better interest to find a therapist 
who can integrate different models. So I forgot to mention, you probably are wondering, what is ACT? What is it specifically? So I told you what CBT is. ACT is acceptance commitment therapy. And one way to easily think about the difference of it between that and CBT is, well, with CBT, we're looking at how your thoughts are dysfunctional, how your negative thoughts and schemas um, make you behave or feel different, what feel sad, anxious, stressed out, and lead to a negative behavior. It's coming from a deficit model. But in ACT, instead of having the patient understand those negative thoughts, I really want you to accept those thoughts, accept that it's natural to have those thoughts. And in fact, you know, have you ever have heard the saying, don't think about the elephant in the room? Well, if someone told you that, you're gonna think about the elephant in the room. And so a lot of times in depression you think, oh, I don't want to think about being sad. I don't want to think about being here on stage in front of all of you, right? So instead, the thing that we do in ACT is to have the patient go ahead and think about those thoughts. And I will actually accept those thoughts and then make a behavior that's mapped on to your values. It's very much about accepting the thoughts and, be, and doing a behavior that's mapped on to what you value. So that's that new wave of, CB, of CBT that I'm, that I'm talking about. So a lot of good, good research going on um, in, in psychotherapy, not just to treat you know, our core mental disorders like depression and anxiety, but also now applying them to different populations. How, you know, how well does it work for African Americans, Hispanics, and for different disease types? So the field has a lot more research to go. Great. Thank you. So, so that's an effort to try to tailor a treatment towards what you perceive as somebody else's needs. Yeah. And we do that in terms of now also looking at drug treatments and then also looking at trying to marry the right drug to the right biology of the brain condition. Can you, that's called personalized medicine. Um, can you, Gordon, tell us a little bit about, explain the term personalized medicine and then also how that's working out for the biology of the kind of conditions you're involved in. Sure, I think <clears throat> Rochelle really described, I was listening to you and thinking, oh, gosh, that really is personalized medicine. Yeah. But yeah. You know, when people refer to personalized medicine with some folks now use as a trendy term, precision medicine, so the idea of tailoring a treatment uh, to a specific person's needs, their biological needs. So, you know, I, I uh, talked a few moments ago about the power of prevention for vascular disease and, and dementia, and um, there's nothing really personalized about that. The idea that risk factor management, diet, and exercise can prevent a negative health, negative health outcome. Uh, that, I said, could uh, reduce dementia risk by, or, or could prevent about 30% of dementias. It's not gonna prevent many of the diseases I mentioned or earlier on, it's not going to prevent Huntington's disease or genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. So personalized medicine or precision medicine is really um, the uh, use of targeted therapies, often uh, molecular therapies targeting genes to treat or prevent very specific genetic disorders or genetic risk factors. And that may sound somewhat abstract, but I think you're all familiar with some of these treatments. The one that comes to mind that's received a lot of press is in cancer, which is CAR-T therapy, which is a type of precision or personalized medicine, which I'm not expert in. So of course I'll talk about it, which is take out your <laughs> white blood cells and teach them to attack the specific cancer you have. Seems really simple to me, but I'm told it's complicated and tough. Um, uh, there's never been a greater time to be a neurologist, and I met a neurologist earlier who I think is retired, and I'm trying to convince him to come back because we have all these really exciting personalized and precision-based therapeutics for neurodegenerative diseases, and I'll give you an example from the area in which I work, which is uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which everyone's familiar with, right, Jerry's kids, and there are a whole bunch of different mutations in the dystrophin gene that cause this. We now have molecular therapies that target specific forms of these mutations. If uh, you have a son who has Duchenne's and they have one of these forms, we use this therapy. If they have a different genetic mutation, you don't. And, and recently, we've had some breakthrough therapies, and I think the most exciting news in modern medicine, we have these molecular therapies. One is an RNA therapy. 
One is a gene therapy for spinal muscular atrophy, which is the most common genetic cause of infantile death, uh, and it's a common cause of infantile paralysis. Kids who get this die by the time they're two years of age. If we use these therapeutics before they get symptoms, it looks like a cure. And uh, um, you know, it, it, it's um, mind-boggling. Absolutely, it brings tears to your eyes. It's, it may seem hard to um, link something that might cure or prevent infantile paralysis to Alzheimer's disease, which is a disease of late adulthood or of the elderly. But these same treatments, not the same drug, mind you, but the same platform, the same mm -hmm. approach is being used to treat other neurodegenerative diseases. So we've just started a phase one trial, for instance, at VCU um, of, a, of a molecular therapy to treat Huntington's disease, which is a dreadful disease. And uh, there are these compounds coming along for genetic forms of Parkinson's disease, and in fact, one that I'm particularly excited about, the, one of the more common genetic causes of ALS is also one of the more common genetic causes of frontotemporal dementia. And uh, there are agents in the pipeline, and we're uh, expecting to participate in these trials as well to treat patients who have uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease or frontotemporal dementia. And so there wasn't, uh, it wasn't too many years ago the idea of treating, much less curing these diseases, would have seemed fantastical. And if you had told me 10, to 10 years ago that we would have cured spinal muscular atrophy, I would say you were using some of Al CBD oil. Um, it's now a reality, and it's, I think, uh, brought a tremendous degree of energy, enthusiasm, and hope to the field of neurodegeneration, including Alzheimer's. Fantastic. What, what about for psychiatry, Bob? Is there genetic testing for psychiatry or drugs? Or so the short answer is there's lots of genetic testing for psychiatry, and there's a big business out there selling that to people. That's the, sadly the reality is it doesn't work. And in fact, the Food and Drug Administration has actually warned people that they don't work. So they because people want to know answers, people want to have precision. But in 2019, we're not there. One of the bases of these tests you can get are based on some of the enzymes that uh, Dr. Arias talked about, the specific enzymes in our bodies that chew up medicines. And depending on the speed in which they occur, concerns have been raised whether or not they may impact the effectiveness or tolerability of medicines. But in present time, there's no evidence that any of these fancy tests that oftentimes insurance companies don't pay for, that oftentimes is north of $1,500 to $2,000, are effective in leading to better outcomes. The only medicine that we regularly prescribe for which we sometimes do a genetic test is for one medicine, and it's really uh, to determine whether or not it is safe in a specific population. Um, but it's, again, not something that happens typically. And so, but I think it speaks to people's hope for something precise or a cure. And you know, you offer somebody something that they really want badly, and people will follow you into the desert. And you just have to be really careful about these sorts of things. And our field sadly has a history of leading a lot of people into a lot of sandy territory. Right, okay. Uh, Al, drugs for, we want to throw open for questions shortly, so um, drugs for addiction problems, so they're not routinely used and one person gets a drug and another person doesn't and someone gets a particular drug, what about personalized medicine for addiction therapy? Right. Well, I think um, uh, let me first say, you know, one of the new exciting things is that these days we, we have a lot of medications now for, for addictive disorders that can be helpful for quitting smoking, very important as we talked about here tonight. Um, now for drinking, there's a, there's a lot of options for people that need to cut down on their drinking or that want to cut down on their drinking. And, um, and there's some, some great options also for treating the current scourge of opioid use disorder. Um, so, so first, I just want to make sure everybody knows that. Uh, so a lot of these treatments are somewhat new, um, or some of the ones that have been around for a while that people haven't known about. 
So, and we have experimental therapies for uh, people with cocaine issues and, and other problems. But um, so along the same lines, in terms of precision medicine, we've been working on this uh, a lot. But the story is kind of similar to with depression and anxiety and, and schizophrenia. Um, so we need to do more work. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, that's one of the areas of research that I work on, uh, precision medicine for treating addictions and in particular uh, alcohol use disorder. And we've had some promising findings over the years. And um, unfortunately, a lot of them have been difficult to, to replicate. Um, but um, I think eventually we will get there in psychiatry and we'll get there for addictions where we can guide uh, medication treatment uh, in a precision fashion. Um, but a lot more work has to be done. Uh, and that's one of the things I do. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing. Uh, and um, we, we really are, I think, on the cusp of some great new discoveries. You know, we're using new methods as the science evolves and translational genomics being incorporated into uh, this, uh, this approach. And um, so we're not there yet. Um, I think we'll get there. Great. We have more questions, but I think we'd be better at this stage move to have you have the opportunity to ask this expert panel any questions uh, that you have. So why don't we throw it open to the floor at this stage. Sir. So let me just, the, the, just so that everybody hears at the back. The question was, is there a relationship between religious beliefs and suicide? Okay, Bob. <laughs> I was actually, I've done this long enough with all the gray hair. I was actually going to repeat the question, but obviously I have a very good boss who does it for me. So I, I'm grateful to you for it, Peter. Uh, so the, uh, the, the short answer is yes. One of the protective factors we were talking about things that we assess for that are put you at risk. There are also factors that are protective. And we know that people with profound religious beliefs is a protective factor. It's not ironclad, but we know that the more religious a person is, it's a, if someone tells me that they're devout, that oftentimes is associated with reduced risk for completing suicide. Okay, great. great question. Rochelle wants to chip in. I yeah. just wanted to add that in the field, we have to um, distinguish between religiosity and spirituality. So religiosity being that you attend church, spirituality is your, your, your mindfulness and thought of a higher being. And both of those things have been protective factors. So it's not that if you, you have to go to church, so to speak, but it doesn't hurt. There's, there'll be a question later about religiosity versus spirituality. We left. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is a really interesting area. Dr. Rochelle talked about ACT and um, getting someone to accept their problem. So, for example, if you had someone who had a fear of flying, it sounded like the first thing would be for them to accept that behavior as a real behavior. Where would you go from there? Well, with a specific phobia like fear of flying, um, we, we want to do some exposure. Uh, and so there's a, co a flip component of this, of the psychophysiological arousal of, that we want to diminish for the patient. So we would do some imaginal, or, um, imaginal exposure type of work but if someone was to use ACT, then I would have them, like you said, go ahead and accept that you do have this fear and allow them to see the association between that negative fear and their behavior um, and uh, you know, be able to understand what are their values, where do they want to go? Do, do they want to fly somewhere? And probably highlight their motivations to want to change in highlighting their values-based part of ACT. So I'd also add to that that you know you don't have to take someone up on a plane anymore to test that. 
you have virtual reality and a whole bunch of other technologies that we can blend with uh, psychological therapies and they've been used in neurological conditions as well. There was a question in the middle of the room, I think. Yes, ma'am? Eric's coming over to you. So my question is back to the suicide. Um, and you had spoken about the likelihood in, in senior adults and also in teenagers. Um, very little experience, but some experience talking to people tells me that people our age um, are more like, are, are likely, not more likely, uh, are likely to in some form express that um, unhappiness, depression, um, recognize that they may be likely to be suicidal. Um, for a variety of reasons, the older you get, you realize that you're not as good as you used to be. In young people, is, is there any recognition, is there any, uh, do they reach out? Has, has there any um, history um, of, of kids reaching out? They're so likely to be into their fingers and their games and their computers. I'm just wondering if, if there's any opportunity for them to voice that depression. And then secondly, going back to your um, question on religion, uh, again, somebody our age who's reached some level of, you know, thanking God for all of the things that you've achieved in life, um, in, and we've kind of taken God out of our lives for the young people, so that's an opportunity lost. So if you'd address both of those. So I, I, I think a couple of things, and then before I, I after I'm done answering, I also want to mention one other thing on a completely topic that we didn't ask about, but people, if we, I guess, had more questions, we'd get to and when we move back and chat. Uh, I want to make sure people know if they have questions about that, we can do that as well. So the, really, the issues about young people oftentimes are a couple things. For kids, really, if you talk about teenagers now, it, there are multiple factors, but key risk factors include Many youngsters don't get treated. The, uh, I think the thing we hear most of, we just thought it was a phase. So oftentimes people diminish challenges youngsters have because they think it is part of typical development. Just to put a fine point on it, wanting to die is not a typical adolescent event. It really is not. Um, and it, although thinking about death and sometimes wishing things could be better off without you occurs again at a rate of about 20%, uh, the reality is that it is not just a phase. And depression, the first episode of depression about which we spoke, occurs typically in a teenager and oftentimes lasts for nine months to 12 months. And so feeling absolutely abhorrent without a a mature sense of self, oftentimes coupled with what we also talked about, which is impulsivity, is not a great combination for all the reasons we talked about. And, and, and then the other question about, again, uh, uh, religiosity, I, I would tell you that, again, um, the important part about uh, whether it be religiosity or spirituality is, is thankfully, um, although folks at a certain point of life at both ends of the spectrum are at more risk, it's still relatively uncommon. Uh, the reason, uh, again, that it's so pronounced or uh, noticeable in teenagers is most teenagers don't have medical conditions that add to these uh, confounding things. And it's one of the things they teach us in uh, at least psychiatric training. You know, you'll, you'll go round, you'll do rounds with people and you'll have two people at the and of a certain age, uh, older folks, who have medical conditions. And one will be profoundly medically ill, like we heard about here. And they'll have all the fight in the world. And you'll have somebody with the exact same condition, if maybe not even as severe. And they'll look 
downtrodden and bedraggled and helpless. And so in many ways, the point is, is most of us go into this world kicking and screaming, and most of us really do want to live regardless of how old we are. And so when someone gets to a certain point, if they really do look that downtrodden, that is not part of typical aging. And, and, and again, the good news is uh, there are all kinds of ways to help folks uh, who have those experiences. And I hope I answered your question. I, I, did, did I? Well, no. with regard to adults, yes. The risks of children are. So yes, that is absolutely. So teenagers typically do not reach out, which is really the question. So the key risk factors for teenager are, first of all, depression, which you don't understand, right? Uh, the other part is impulsivity. Uh, Al here, he's going to talk, talk. Certainly, substance abuse. They oftentimes occur in combination. But the real tragedy is there. These are treatable conditions in teenagers. 20% of teenagers with serious psychiatric conditions receive treatment. The 80% do not. Let me just say that again. 80% do not. If we were talking about any other general medical condition, you would think there would be all kinds of noise about that. But this is from the Surgeon General. This is not me talking to a group of nice folks. And so one of the things I'm committed to, Dr. Buckley and our committee, uh, and our community, of which you are a part, is our commitment to do better for our folks and enhance our ability to offer care uh, as we continue to move. Because in the United States, it is 20%. 80% go untreated, undiagnosed. And that means people suffer. And so we want to do better than that. So uh, we, are, we, will as we will aspire to greatness. Question down the back. I think this is question somewhere. I, yes, I have, I have a question. Can you hear me? Uh, these programs are a wonderful way for us to keep up with the state of the science in medicine and, and healthcare and treatment, and we really appreciate that over the years. Um, my question is about anxiety and, and depression specifically. Um, as compared to conditions like heart disease and cancer where we seem to have many metrics to talk about cure rate and uh, increase in life expectancy, and, and when it comes to depression and anxiety, I'd like to hear from the panel where, what kind of progress we feel like we're making. Uh, it might not be as easily quantifiable the way that other conditions or diseases are in terms of treatment and effectiveness, but is, is there a way to, to quantify it for us that may be looking to understand a level of, of progress and where we stand? Do you, want, do you want to take that? And then we'll so see. Before I answer your question, because I actually know how to answer your question. I'm not sort of doing a stalling tactic. Oftentimes when we have these things, people oftentimes ask about autism. So in, again, when it comes time for back there, if anyone wants to chat about autism, um, I know a thing enough about it to be hopefully informative. And in fact, I just came back from Belgrade lecturing on autism uh, as a particular type of autism. To answer your questions, the short answer is we can actually measure anxiety. We can measure depression, but not with blood tests and the like, but actually uh, questionnaires and other types of instruments, many developed by psychologists. And I've spent a good part of my career developing questionnaires for mood disorders and anxiety disorders, specifically for young people when they did not exist. So we can measure this. We can measure our successes. And we can measure our failures and identify them. Um, so in fact, what sometimes seems fuzzy, vague, abstract, can actually be quantified accurately and effectively. And, and, and I don't think we always do a good job talking about the kinds of precision we are able to bring. But it's not going to be the same kind that Dr. Smith will. It'll be the kind that Rochelle and Al and Peter and I can, but they're highly 
effective measurements and very precise. I don't know, Rochelle, that's... Let me give the last word to Rochelle, and then we're going to invite Wyatt on. Yeah. Okay. So, um, with regard to this, yes, I'd have to say that um, um, with personalizing our therapies, we've done a really good job. And part of that is the training and skill that psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, mental health professionals have, as well as um, just being having that experience in talking and working with, with someone. That relationship is really important. As Dr. Finland said, we have great science behind our self-report questionnaires. There's a whole field of how to develop questionnaires. There's a right way of doing it. There's an empirical support method of testing that out over time and checking the validity of it. Um, but I wanted to say that the, um, one of the things that we have to think about is how can we provide good personalized treatment for you all? I wanted to say that you're talking about 20% for kids, but 60% of adults are having have access to treatment for depression, and that could be either therapy or medication. And still, because we know depression affects a lot of our health, health behaviors, that's probably not as good. And we know that we have good, effective therapies for depression and anxiety. So I think there's still a lot of room to grow. Okay. Now, we've kind of come to the end of this session, but uh, as uh, Margaret Ann had said, there, there will be the opportunity at the back of the room, each of our colleagues who are clearly experts in their area, uh, each of our colleagues will be at a different table. So you'll kind of be able to do some kind of trick-or-treating thing and go and uh, ask them whatever questions My table will have good candy. I'm not sure what else. <laughs> so at, at this stage, we're going to close it out and, and, and ask uh, Mr. Wyatt Be Beasley to come up. And Wyatt is the uh, chair of our foundation. He's a partner in the law firm of William Mullins. He's, he's a leading figure in Richmond, and he's been immensely supportive of the foundation of our, and of our school. So Wyatt, close Thank us out. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. That nice over-exaggeration, but I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> before I get going, I am going to ask the panel to go ahead and retire to the Osprey Grill so that they are ready for your questions uh, when we go in there in just a moment. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. I hope everyone found this as informative and educational as I did. It's obviously a very important area, but and a broad area. So in a moment, we're all gonna go back to the Osprey Grill, and I hope you will take the opportunity to go get a drink, get some food, Go find Rochelle and have her tell you how to change your behavior going forward. Uh, and otherwise, talk to our panelists. Uh, and honestly, I, I do thank everybody for coming. And I will release you in two seconds. Uh, before I do so, I would like to thank our host committee again. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. Been absolutely fantastic as far as garnering support. <laughs> helping us pick topics and uh, really just getting the community out here. Thank you again. Also, I'd like to thank our Discovery Society members who are here tonight. Uh, frankly, we brag about you folks all the time back at the MCV campus. You've been such a fantastic kind of tidal wave of support for us. And I hope that that will continue and you'll help us expand that and become a tsunami of support going forward. So thank you. Um, at the end of the night, there'll be uh, membership pack or packets of information on our speakers and also on the Discovery Society for everybody to take with you. Uh, and on that, I'll ask everybody to retire to the uh, Oyster Osprey Grill, and thank you for coming. <laughs>